Thank you. Uh, it's not my fault that it's this early in the morning. Okay. Uh, hopefully we're all awake with a good Italian coffee. Uh, okay. You have a question already. Wow. About the coffee. It's too. Ah. Like a, like a gravitational wave. You don't know where the sound is coming from. So where do I put it? This way? Hello? Is it better? No? Yes? Okay, I'm not a fashion designer, even though we are in the fashion week. Uh, yeah? This way? Do you want to try? Yeah, that's better. You just put it in the center. The big sound is not so good. Is it better? Yes, much better. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's remind ourselves what we're trying to do. So in principle, the theory we're developing works for any kind of source. Uh, we were studying the propagation in the last uh, lecture. We concentrate on this side, a linear order. where we solve here and we found the two modes. And we discuss a little bit how to see this in the detector. Now we're going to concentrate on the source. In principle, there is some T minu here of matter. And <clears throat> as we will see, not perhaps in the traditional way, but in the more uh, modern way, there is also a source of gravitational waves by the gravitational field itself. There is some energy here that is changing with time, and it's not just only because of the motion, also because the potential is changing. So the time-dependent potential produces a change in the energy density of the gravitational field that can also source gravitational waves. Okay? And this will be one of the... Uh, one of our main, main goals and one of the main differences with electromagnetism would be to understand how to include that effect. Okay? All the nonlinearities of general relativity and the fact that gravitational fields, time varying gravitational fields, can also source gravitational waves. Okay? But in principle, this diminu could be anything. It doesn't have to be um, a binary system. It could be a star that is also pulsing, for example, it's some asymmetric time-dependent quadruple moment will also radiate gravitational waves. It doesn't have to be a binary system, okay? It so happens that this is one of the most interesting and also one of the prominent sources of gravitational waves, and that's what we'll, we'll uh, concentrate on. But there are, of course, sources of gravitational waves of uh, many origins, and uh, like we're searching for any kind of source, okay? So in principle, there is some T minu here, and that's going to source the wave that we already study the propagation of. Okay, so here the difference with this case is the equation. And remember, now we're going to go to the T gate. Or if you want, let's write generally first. It's source, it's sourced by um, stress energy tensor, and since we're going to do a uh, linear. This will be, for example, matter. And we will see what happens if you have, for example, black holes, okay, in which there is a zero on this side. Very good. So our, our uh, goal now would be to solve these equations, a linear order. And as we determined last time, it looks a lot like electromagnetism. So we're going to have some green this is the box, as usual. Um, I'm not going to waste too much time on this uh, details because I'm assuming that most of you have seen in Jackson how the radiation problem works in QED or electromagnetism. This is the same, except that now we have two indices. This will be box of A mu equal to J mu. And then you have a Green's function there. You have the retardation time and so on. So we're just going to go through that. Okay, so I'm going to just write the answer. in the TT gauge. Uh, 
Remember, there's a Green's function that gives you the 1 over 4 pi, x minus x prime, that kills the 16 pi, and that gives you the 4. Okay. Or if you want to do this as an exercise, if you have the afternoon to go over these things, this is a 1 over r, that's the Laplacian part. And then there is the uh, retarded time. t minus x minus x prime. Um, here I'm going to put the c's back just to um, uh, keep track of the fact that we're going to do the post-Newtonian expansion later. So we're going to be comparing with velocities which are small with respect to the speed of light. I might forget about the c's at some point uh, along the way. Hopefully not. So t prime minus t return. And then x, uh, x prime. T and X. And we're going to do an approximation now in which you're going to say X minus X prime. I look far away from the source, this is x, and we're going to have points on, that we're integrating on, which is x prime, and this is the distance that we care about, right? x minus x prime. So we are looking for very, very far away. So there is a certain distance here. We can call it d. So essentially, x minus x prime and r, the distance to the source, is almost the same, right? If we look, if we call n the uh, direction in which we're looking at, then the only difference will be like this projection on the end direction when you start expanding, Taylor expanding in x prime over x because x prime is bounded by d. Okay, this is the usual uh, 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 multiple expansion that is gonna come up, okay? So it's easy to see that x minus x prime is essentially um, r, which is the distance that we're looking at. This is x, and x is equal to r in the n direction, minus x prime that x over r plus order d squared over squared. So this will be x dot n. And you've done this in electromagnetism many times. There is a distribution of charge. You're looking far away, and you start expanding this guy. Right? This is not how we're going to do it. And I have to admit, I have to remind myself how this is done, because uh, um, we will never go through the field. One of the virtues of the way we're going to try to calculate um, the gravitational waveform is that we might bypass directly trying to solve these equations and go directly to the observable, which would be, for example, the total power. So I'm going to try now to derive from here what the, um, the metric will look like far away and what the power emitted in gravitational wave is, which many of you probably already know is the quadruple formula. 
So you will see now we're going to walk through the traditional way to get in the quadrupole formula, which is very similar to getting the dipole radiation in QED, because this is a linear theory. So what, I, what I'm going to write right now is exactly the same that is in Jackson with two indices. Okay? Now we're going to rewrite that with these other methods, and we will never have to do this again. Okay? And then we will know how to uh, go to higher orders. Now, maybe as an exercise, after this lecture is done, go back and redo Jackson the way I want to teach you in the last two lectures. Okay? Because then you will see the power of the methods. Okay? Very good. And the fact that I had to remind myself how all this goes tells you that it's not necessary. Um, okay, very good. So now the only thing I'm going to do is just put it here. And, uh, and we're going to actually go to Fourier space because it's going to be... Uh, so we're going to study the, the, what, what's going to happen is that there's going to be a typical wavelength of the radiation. And that typical wavelength of the radiation will be compared with the size of the object and the time dependence inside the, the, that depends on the dynamics of, for example, the binary system. And that will allow us to multiple expand the field, and that's how we're going to get the quadruples and so on. Okay? So that's where we're going at. So what I'm going to define is the Fourier transform. Uh, D3x. T to the I kx, and I hope I got the signs right. And that's again for you to um, go back. And uh, if I if I get the exponentials wrong when I'm doing this, because I go through this space in this direction or this direction, please check. What am I doing? This is because the typical case and the typical omegas will be associated with the dynamics. Okay. And therefore, we can expand this guy. And that's how it will be my, like directly related to the wave, wavelength of the, of the field. Okay? So now what's going to happen is that if I write my t as a function of, uh, so if I replace this in here, and I write my t as a function of the Fourier transform, then the e to the x uh, becomes an integral here, it will be x prime. And this will be an x prime dot n, okay? But there is a k, and there is an x prime dot n, and there will be an integral in, in d3x, and that will give you a delta function in k minus uh, n, okay? And this is what, how we get here. Let me write one step before if, you, if it's too quick. Uh, one other thing that I didn't say. Is um, we go into the TT gauge, but in principle, uh, nobody said anything here. Remember, I didn't write TT yet, but if I go to the TT gauge, there are certain uh, conditions, the transfer traceless, that I have to impose in this uh, T menu. So we're going to introduce this projector. This projector uh, will project the field. We project the field directly into the transfer traceless with this condition. We have to take the trace out. And this P is Ni in J or delta J. If I got the sign correctly. So what this does is project away the trace and also makes it transverse. Okay? Now I'm so used to that guy, I think I didn't write who he is. So here, if we're going to do the TT gauge projection, here I have to put TT. Here I have to put KL. And here I have to put this lambda. OK? Now, why this is going to be important is because at, at, at some point, we're going we're to have an angular integral. 
right? Because we're going to compute the power, the total power. And that angular integral will depend in integrals on the solid angle of these directions. And that's how this 1 over 5 is going to come out. This is what projects really the true physical degrees of freedom that are going to propagate. OK. Well, now we do the Fourier transform. So now we are in the TT gauge. So this depends on the direction. N is the direction, which is outside, right? This is us looking at the, at the time dependent. Well, I haven't yet introduced time, but at the varying T mu nu that's going to uh, produce uh, the gravitational wave. And then we have the integral. And now we are in Fourier space. Wait, OK. Yes? Huh. And we're going to replace this here in the time by that, what's going to introduce is like the e to the ikx gets shifted by this n dot x prime, right? Because now x prime is going to be not only here, but also here. And therefore, we get the, the part from the retarded time, and then a part from um, sorry, x prime is k minus omega n, and I'm going to put the c again. Um, the c here, because later we're going to compare to like, like the post-Newtonian expansion. And we do this because then you see that, as expected, we have the on-shell mode of the radiation, and that will set the scale of k to omega. Okay. So that will give us a delta function. I forgot the four. You're not awake. Well, neither am I. Um, this, this is the case at one over r, obviously, because now there's a one over r pulling out, right? This part you should know. So you should be able to be confident to tell me you forgot something. Um, it's very interesting, right? This is the field that we observe. I just want to make a comment here. And it goes at one over r. If we do the A, the A mu, the electromagnetism, you also get the 1 over R, but we observe the electric field, so you get R squared. Okay? So it's interesting that only the case of 1 over R, because you can see farther. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we have the projector. And we're going to do the interval in, in uh, X primes, which gives me the delta function. And the delta function, then we can do the integral in, in k, and essentially sets this to omega. So at the end of the day, we end up with something like this. And this is completely generic. That's the solution, right? And it does not depend on the dynamics. It's, it's a linear order, obviously, but it does not depend on, on, on whether the dynamics is in the post-Newtonian regime or a strong regime or anything. We did an approximation that the gravitational field stays at the linear order, but if the theory is linear, that is the answer. We haven't, we haven't done any approximation yet. So the key will be now to say something about this guy, which allows us now to do this multiple expansion. OK? But that's essentially the answer that is in the books that probably many of you have seen already. Correct? I don't see many noddings, but. Um. Now, the, 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 the catch that actually what I'm going to do now is not 
It's not entirely the same way that it's done in books. Um, so it's clear here that there is a distinction. Um, even though this omega is, uh, is entering here in both places, right? So there is a distinction between space and time. And actually, in the post expansion, we are breaking those variants and the time scales and the, and the, the variation in space and time. Here, the on-shell propagation will be on-shell. I mean, really, the k will be omega. But whatever dynamics is happening here, right? It could be it's, it's certainly restricted to this. Uh, let's not. Okay, sorry. This r is the distance far away. Let's call this big r, even though earlier I called it r. Um, it's confined to this size r, or I call it d. I call it d. Sorry. Or this box is d. Say. But it could be changing with time very slowly, very, very slowly. So it doesn't have to be d over c fast, OK? And that's why the c is there. It doesn't have to be that this is going up and down on the speed of light. So there is a separation in time and space. And that's what we're going to benefit from, OK? In fact, this will happen also when we write our effective theory, is that there will be, just getting ahead of ourselves, there will be the coupling in space, but not in time. Okay. So what that means is that there will be, we're going to multiple expand because the lambda here we're going to assume, or the omega, that is dynamics that is definitely certainly not as fast as the speed of light. Okay. So the lambda um, is much longer than d in this case. And that's how we're going to then multiple expand, but only, only on this side. OK? So the omega in time will go for the right, and the times are going to be uh, all evaluated at retarded time. All the multiples that are, are going to come from expanding in space are going to be evaluated at retarded time, but they're going to go for the right. The multiple expansion is in k. OK? Uh, this is important. Because what we're saying here is that k dot d, if you want this d, or x prime, if you want, which was the, the variable that we used to, to determine the points inside this box, is less than 1. So that would be the. It's related to this post-Newtonian approximation in which the time variation here is less than the speed of light. Okay. So now we're gonna multiple expand the field. And what do we do? This is something that we're gonna also use later. Um, So if you look at the definition of this guy, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to use x, but it's a, it's a dummy variable, right? Um, I'm not putting indices, but uh, I want to just get this idea. Let's call it x prime just to remember that this is uh, inside the source. So if the k of the wave is longer, the one or lambda, right, than the size, right? So the condition is omega d over c, much less, less than 1, this condition. Then we can expand this and leave this one alone. <clears throat> and if you start expanding, what's going to happen is 
So you expand this, and then you get the integral of dt x t of x and t e to the omega t plus integral one i <coughs> k x t dot of x t minus k i k j and then x i x j integral t so you start seeing these moments coming up and we are expanding in this even though the x is inside the integral because this is bounded the t mu is bounded to this region okay now this is tricky and this is one of the um, the big discussions we have with the purist um, this is all fine as long as the field and the t mu right live in kind of different spaces right so the t mu is confined to be here and therefore, it's a localized compact support source. But what happens, and when the gravitational potential center and also are part of the dynamics, that's also compact and here. That's what we will call, we will call this like the near zone. These are fields which have compact support. By definition, the, those dynamics are happening here. But what happens when this way start talking to uh, this potential that I was telling you before, potential if you want the metric of the binary outside right now this time dependence here and this dynamics is happening it has no compact support anymore right because this in principle propagates to infinity so defining these multiples when this t mu nu now also includes all the part of the gravitational field might become subtle okay and since we're not going to do this we're not going to run into this problem but if you want to do it this way, it's non-trivial. This is called the near zone, and this becomes what is called the wave zone. And to properly define these moments, when the t mu nu now also depends on the t mu nu of the gravitational field that in principle might not have compact support, then it becomes trickier. Because what does it mean to do this multiple expansion? Um, we will not have that problem, and you'll see how we circumvent that when we get to it. <clears throat> but this is the standard multiple expansion in a linear theory when the source is essentially just uh, localized. So you already see where we're going. I don't think this is, um, I don't think this is how it's done in textbooks, but the reason I'm doing it this way, like expanding here, this guy, and the exponential, is because you notice also one thing which will be interesting for us. If we do um, particle physics, we compute amplitudes. So there will be amplitudes everywhere. Amplitudes live in Fourier space. They're nice in Fourier space because we can calculate with Feynman diagrams and so on. So in Fourier space, there'll be a one-point function that will be associated with this object, right? So this object will emit gravitational waves, and there will be a source that will be our t mu nu. And if I have an omega and k here for the graviton, there's a t mu nu omega and k. And then you notice that if you read off this guy and you do the Fourier expansion of the k component, I'm expanding in k, right? Then the components of that Taylor expansion in k of your object that you compute doing something else, right? Some amplitude, we'll see in which theory we're going to compute. Then immediately you get the moments. The moments will be the factors in the Taylor expansion. So if somebody handles you this object, and doesn't matter how you got it. And you're expanding k, not in omega, in k. The components are exactly already the, the moments. And if I have a formula that we will compute that tells you that the power is time variations of these moments, then you just have to compute them and then just put dots and you're done. Okay? <clears throat> Uh, very good. So now we have this guy up here in uh, um, Fourier space. The k, here the k, is omega n, right? 
So then instead of k, and this, sorry, this should have put primes. Doesn't matter, it's, in, it's a dummy variable, right? But the k now, when I, expand, when I use this expansion here, it becomes omega n. So when I plug this in here, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have a bunch of omegas to the n power, a bunch of n's dotted into these multiples. And the omegas are going to become, because I'm in Fourier space, I'm integrating an omega, they're going to become like derivatives of this thing. And then I'm going to do the omega integral, and I'm going to put it in t minus uh, t retard. And then I'm done. So the answer, and do this as an exercise, um, is going to look like this. This is 4g over r. Then I have our projector. And here, I have a bunch of multiples. So this is the first one that we just calculated. The first one is very simple. It's this. When I put it there, um, so what's going to happen is that uh, the, the uh, omega integral is evaluated now in order t, but t minus uh, rc, r over c, if you want. All the t does, it just goes for the right. I mean, you just have to evaluate it at whatever it was, and this is t minus rc. In fact, you'll see what we do in our papers is actually we do some partial Fourier transform. We keep this as t, and we just Fourier transform in k, because there is the split where the functions will be time dependent, but we can really do the coupling in, in space. Okay? But you can just keep the omega. Um, so maybe I just put one, one step earlier. Um, so this one is easy because there is no, there is no omega, right? There is only the e to the i. Um, but then let's just write, before we take the derivatives, um, let's just write the d omega. It's here, e to the i, omega c. And then there's omega to the n, i omega to the n or let me put it this way, to the L, so just not to confuse. Uh, then there is X, uh, let's call it X, let's not call it X prime. It, don't get confused, let's go, well, let's call it X prime. Uh, too many variables. X prime, this notation appears many times because we have I1, I2, until IL numbers. Sometimes we write this that's x prime to the L, OK? As is TKL, uh, omega, and x prime. And there is an L factorial here. So plus dot, 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 right? So this is the generic term that we're going to get. So it would be a sum in L, if you want, sum in L plus. So of all the moments, and all the k's get replaced by this. And who are we doing this with? We're doing this with the n's. n i1 and i And now we just have to put these guys here as derivatives to the L of t k. And then we do the omega integral and we evaluate this at this. And we get this times the moment, right? Was that too quick? I just, I just do the d omega. I trade these guys by the derivatives because there's e to the i omega here. So I can trade that by d by dt. And then I do the integral. 
and evaluate this in T minus uh, our C. Now, I'm not going to deal with these guys. So these are the Huygen multiples. There's, there's a lot of issues here. Is that um, this is not yet reduced. So this transforms as a tensor. There are some symmetric components, right? There are symmetric properties of this tensor and symmetric properties of this tensor. It's reducible. You can do uh, your group theory and reduce this into irreducible representations, right? Traces and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that I will not do it at this level. I will do it uh, in the effective theory, how we do this tensor reduction. I'm going to keep just this term because this is going to be the quadruple formula, just this guy. But then you see that then at higher orders, what is your power counting? Your power counting will be, th this has nothing to do, um, I mean, there is a post Newtonian expansion hidden here because the ratio in the case of the binary, the ratio of lambda over R, right? The typical frequency of this problem is associated with the typical orbital frequency. That's some, I think I call it omega. So the typical omega of the gravitational wave is twice this guy. And this is V over R. So when you do that for the binary case, there's a factor of V that appears in the ratio between D and lambda because D becomes R. So then this expansion, which is an expansion in, in kx much less than one, right? And d over lambda becomes an expansion in v because the typical omega of the problem, right, is v over r. And therefore, that ratio becomes, this expansion here becomes an expansion in, in v. So this is a multiple expansion. In the case of the, let's, let's go back to, uh, I don't want to go back to r. This is not R, so let's call it R, and R is the distance between the binary. And let's call D the box and R the separation. So it's an expansion in R over lambda much, much less than one. This has nothing to do with post-Newtonian. It's just a plain old-fashioned multiple expansion. But the point is that who this lambda is for the case now of a binary system. And then lambda, because omega is v over r, lambda is r over v. Like you're building up this wave moving very slowly. And therefore, the wave length is longer. You oscillate, right? And that frequency, since it's on shell, omega, right? The k is omega and it's uh, um, r over v. And therefore, this ratio becomes v. And then this multiple expansion becomes an expansion in V much less than one. But in principle, it has nothing to do with V, OK? And in fact, this is what's going to complicate things a little in the future. It's like we have a multiple expansion that depends on V. Each one of these guys themselves, we have V expansions. They will have corrections from the nonlinearities. The, the nonlinearities will be proportional to the binding energy. The binding energy of the system goes like G which also goes like V, and then everything will be an expansion in V. But the physics, the relevant scales, will be completely unrelated in principle. As a matter of principle, the nonlinearities and the multiple expansion could be completely unrelated to each other. So you need to be able to disentangle and understand what comes from where. And that's what this effective theory will do for us. Okay? But at this level, we just learned that we can do a multiple expansion when this field is confined here and varying in time slowly, such that this approximation is valid. And then we, we have a suppression, which is precisely this expansion parameter, which is omega times one of these x. This x is inside the box. And this box is d, so omega d. Each one of these guys will come down with an omega d, which is less than 1. Okay. Ultimately, this will be all post-Newtonian, but that's just multiple expansion. Now, what is the first term? This is the first term. Does this look like the quadruple formula? Not yet, right? How, 
How many of you remember how to get the quadruple formula out of here? Ah, good. <laughs> then you don't remember <coughs> how to do the quadruple formula. What is confusing when you stare at this is that, wait a minute, what are those indices doing here? Right? What is the quadruple? So the quadruple will be, by definition, an integral of this guy. So how are we going to make this guy appear here? And how are we going to get this guy appear when it looks like it should come from here? And these are all spatial indices. Where is the temporal indices coming from? OK. Well, this is how we need to organize the calculation a little better and trying to understand which multiples really enter. How to disentangle the multiple expansion in terms of these irreducible representations. And this is what we're going to do uh, later when we write the effective theory. But it's not very hard to see why this and time derivatives of this, which is what we're going to get at, right? We're going to get time derivatives, we want this to be time derivatives of this, right? How those could be related? And the fact is that a linear order, we know that the t minus is conserved. So what does this tell us is that we make derivatives, and you make special derivatives, OK, uh, J. They're related. Fluxes, right? And if you take one more, you get another dot and another derivative. So what you know is that two derivatives of the t0 zero, zero And then what you do is, um, so what you do is you put this guy here, x i x j, um, d k d l, d k l, and then you integrate by parts, and then you see you're gonna pick up a factor of two because you're gonna hit either this or this, and then the, la the, the next one, so you're gonna get a delta of k j k i, and then this one only has one to, k to hit left, so you get Tij plus Tji. Um, and this is the same twice. So then you get um, this. You can replace by the tan derivative, but you get twice this. So then you get at the end of the day that the integral of this guy is equals a half. T0, 0. And now this is a partial derivative. These are partial derivatives. This function depends on t and x. So there's a partial derivative with respect to time. I'm not touching space. So I can pull it out of the integral. And then I get T0, 0, zero Tx, Xi, Xj. And the two is just because I get two guys. And now, ha, now I go my quadruple. This is my QH. And instead of a four, it's a half, I get a two. OK? And every x costs me a derivative from here.
So now we arrive at the end of the row. which we proved, from here we drop all these subleading corrections, we keep only this, we use these things I call moment relations, because the moment, the, the moment of t, the first moment of t, which is this integral, is related to the second moment of t0,0, zero zero, up to time derivatives, so these are called moment relations that come from conservation laws. Now you might ask, how is this modified if now I have a nonlinear theory? Well, you have to have a conserved charge here, which is not just the matter part, but also the gravitational field. So when we do these tricks, the Q itself is going to be source, or it's going to have components from the gravitational field itself. And that will be part of, the, of, your, of your job, will be to know here, when I replace this T by the nonlinear T, or the full T mu, nu, including the gravitational field, how to calculate this, OK? That's also all these nonlinearities of general relativity that we need to find a systematic way to compute. I could not possibly lecture about how they do it. I'm going to tell you how we do it. Um, but now we, we arrive at the end of the row. At least the linear theory we can do is not too hard. This is 2 over r. We get this projector. And now we get two derivatives. And now, when I do the integral, now the derivatives, this function now is only a function of time. So those partial derivatives are just derivatives. Right? And this is evaluated in t minus. Plus dot, dot, dot. And this is our frame. Okay. So now we're almost there into compute in computing the power. So we learn. What do we learn? Um, well, what I'm going to say is it, just uh, words, because it's actually a little more subtle than what I'm going to say. But often you hear these words. Um, so in electromagnetism, you have dipole radiation, right? You have moving charges that accelerate and radiate. Now in gravity. If you have the binary system, you do have a dipole, if you want, with just with two particles. So you, the dipole will be just with one x, right? So, but let's do it exactly. So who is this guy? Well, this is the center of mass. And this guy, if I put a dot, doesn't move. So this cannot radiate. So you cannot have dipole radiation in gravity just simply because of uh, uh, the equivalence principle uh, that the center of mass they put. Right? There is no external nothing force, nothing. So this is not going to move. So the first moment is the mass that also doesn't move. So the second moment is the first one you hit. Okay. Now you're going to object immediately, but wait a second, isn't this radiating? Is, what is m dot? Is it really zero? I mean, is, what is this guy? Well, the, the mass of the system is changing, right? But you have to be careful. We're in the linearized theory here, right? So you can generalize these concepts to actually understand why this is truly just a quadruple radiation. But naively, if you just say, OK, the mass, the mass is changing with time. OK? But at this order, it's all fine. Now think about it. How could you formalize this? And, and who the true team you know is, and who these charges really are, and so on. OK? It gets a little trickier. But at this order, we can just say, OK, the mass the T0,0 zero zero is conserved because I just told you the T mu nu, the, I just told you about the conservation law, right? I just told you this comes from here, okay? So I'm ignoring all the, cha the changes. 
and therefore um, uh, the only radiation that can come out is, is this guy. Okay. It's also obvious that you have two indices, you need two indices, and you just cannot write anything. Okay. As an effective field theorist, even when we construct our effective action, you'll see you cannot write anything that is gauge invariant and has only one index. Okay? So there's nothing that can radiate as a dipole. What will you couple it to? So think about, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I cannot resist. Um, so who you couple this to? Right? So it has two indices, so I can couple to something that has two indices, and it has to be gauge invariant, at least a linear order. And we talked about gauge invariant objects. When I compute the displacement, that I told you that the curvature could be evaluated in TTE gauge because it was invariant. So at least in order, I can use the curvature. But I cannot use one index. And this guy will be generalized into something like an electric field. So what an electromagnetism looks like P dot E gets replaced in gravity by Q dot E. But it just has one more index to make it get bar. Okay? There is no way to write something linear that is gauging bar. You can with connections or one derivative of the metric, but that clearly is gauge dependent. Okay, good. So now we're going to derive uh, the quadruple formula, meaning how we compute the power, which is similar to the dipole radiation, but now we have more, more derivatives. Um, there are two lessons here. In gravity, you need masses, the really dynamical evolution of, of moving uh, matter that is really fast to produce gravitational waves that can be seen. And we will estimate this uh, in, in a little bit. Um, let me derive the quadruple formula, and then we take a little break. So uh, Mark is going to let me go a little longer, and we do uh, we do a little more about like how can we use this and what we learned yesterday to take the LIGO data and basically extract all the information about the gravitational waves. The, at least the first detection. Of gravitational waves. The first detection of gravitational waves with this and the formula I'm going to derive now, the quadruple formula, you get almost everything. Okay, and it's kind of neat. Um, okay, so now let's derive the quadruple formula. Um, is there any question? No, we're all happy. Yes. Why do we use partial for the equation, not the I'm a linear order. This is all linearized. There will be this T mu is concentrated in in the box, the T mu has support here. So if you're going to use a covariant derivative, you could say this is zero with this guy here. So metric of metric degrees of freedom that live in here. And in fact, we will do that when we get the nonlinear uh, effect. So there could be sources that are purely potentials or purely binding energy. Uh, but at this order, we are only sourcing. Another way to put it, we're looking at this coupling, right? And it's all linear, right? So this is a conserved quantity because of the invariance of this guy under the shift that I just told you. And then the this mu hit, this is zero. So then at this order, it's, it's conserved. Now, in linearized gravity, there is a conserved quantity. We will always keep that partial derivative, by the way. This will be, we will just a detour. This will be true, right, with the T minute that does not include the gravitational field. And this will be too, true for the conserved quantity that is this pseudo tensor that includes the gravitational field. And in fact, I'm about to use this guy to compute the gravitational wave power. Okay? So I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is the T minute that is covariantly conserved, the one that appears in the right hand side of Einstein's equation, because the Einstein's equations, T minu equal a pi. T minu. When we do this, with this being the covariant derivative, that's what you're familiar with, right? But if I'm linearizing gravity and expanding this guy and put it on the other side, I can find a conserved quantity, and often it's called the sometimes it's called the Landau tensor because it appears in Landau leashes. Um, it's uh, um, 
It's a conserved quantity using the linearized equations of motion that includes corrections, which are also quadratic in the field. Okay. By that I mean that when you put the quadratic corrections here, so what did we do? We did box H equal T mu, nu, but here we put it on the other side, there is some stuff. Okay? And that stuff can be used to define this T mu, nu, which is conserved. Okay? We can think about this guy as our new T mu. Nu. Okay? And that's a great question because we're going to use now this guy to compute the power. And this is a very long discussion that I'm not going to get into. Um, do gravitational waves carry energy? Where am I, where am I going to calculate now? I'm going to tell you I'm going to do the compute the power. And where is the power? The power is that the uh, energy of the system is changing with time. And by how am I going to calculate the change in time of the energy of the system? By calculating how much energy is being carried away by the waves. So I'm going to calculate how much power crosses us. So this is the dynamics in the box, D. We are far away, R, right? And there is some flux of gravitational waves. It's on surface. How much flux, how much energy is being lost. And I'm going to say that's minus what this guy lost. All right? But this is a big discussion. I can always go to a frame in which I can get rid of that metric perturbation. Right? Remember, you always have uh, uh, the freedom at every point to do coordinate transformations. Right? The point is that there is curvature. I cannot get rid of the weight everywhere. So there is energy, it's just it's not localized. You cannot just really squeeze it, right? It is, the energy is in the relationship between the local frames, in the curvature, right? So it's, 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 it's there, but so you can, you can take some glass of water, you can shine some gravitational waves, and it will heat up, okay? But if you go to a point here, I mean, it's hard to define temperature in one point. Uh, you can certainly get rid of the metric field. Okay? That does not mean that we're not going to heat up the glass of water. Okay? But for a long time, people were very confused about where is the energy of the gravitational wave. <clears throat> well, certainly, um, as you know, there is the Hulse-Taylor pulsar that is uh, shrinking, the period. Um, uh, it's changing with time uh, exactly according to the formula that we're about to derive, which means that the system is losing energy and it's losing into gravitational waves. So that resolves the controversy, at least um, for now. You'd be surprised to hear that Einstein tried to do these manipulations uh, post Maxwell. And um, he got it wrong twice. First, um, he didn't realize. So what this does is th this kills, I could just put it here, right? This is symmetric, so I don't have to put the S, even though later the moments that will appear will have to be symmetrized. So it's symmetric, and it's also trace-free, the part that we care. Well, he had a, an answer that his first paper, I forgot which year exactly it was, um, he computed this, um, the, the linearized gravity, and he computed something that had a radiation that even when the trace of the quadrupole was not zero, so even the trace will source gravitational waves in his formula. So that was wrong. He was getting unphysical modes of the gravitational field. That was okay. He later corrected it. He did not admit that he made a mistake, of course been him. The formula was almost correct. He was off by a factor of two. I forgot if, it was, if he had a four or, or not the two. But he got it, not, not this formula, the quadruple formula, but he got it wrong by a factor of two. Okay? And then later, in life, 
he, um, he has this very famous story with the physical review in which he submitted a paper, I forgot the collaborator, unfortunately, in which he thought, okay, this is linearized gravity. What if I try to find plane wave solutions of full GR, of full nonlinear GR, which, by the way, were found and understood also later in the 60s by Pirani, I think. Um, he claimed that then the solution would be gone and there wouldn't be any gravitational waves. And then the, the reviewer, who was uh, Robertson, from the Robertson metric, the FRW, uh, uh, said, no, there is a mistake here. And Einstein was upset, and he took the paper away and said, I did not send the paper for reviewing, I sent it for publication. <laughs> and they, um, they did not publish it. Then he found the mistake and submitted it to another journal, some obscure journal. It was published, but then he did not claim that gravitational waves were not real. So um, he had a, a long story against gravitational waves, he got it wrong twice, and then he said they did not exist. Okay. He also did not like black holes, but then I'll tell you about that later. Um, so you see, you can be Einstein and be one of the greatest and still make lots of mistakes. So don't feel bad if we make mistakes, it's all good. Um, okay, so how do we derive the quadruple formula now? We're gonna use this guy because this is now, um, so another way to put it is the following. We have the einstein hilbert action, <coughs> the action of GR, um, I used the minus 2 and Planck, if you remember, but it's just the 16 pi G Newton. Um, so if we go to, uh, so what we did essentially is when we got the, this equation, we had gone to quadratic order because the derivative with respect to H gives you the uh, second operator on H equal the T minu. So what happens is that at quadratic order, there is some operator here, which is second derivative. And then we couple this to the T mu nu of matter. And we vary with respect to H mu nu, and we get some operator times H mu nu times T mu nu. That's the equations that we're trying to solve that are erased. That's linearized, okay? We found a gauge in which we could invert this operator, right? Which for, as you're familiar with, in the, in the language of field theory, is like when we compute the propagator, we're going to fix the gauge to be able to invert this guy. Right? You do the same in, a, in electromagnetism. Right? It's just a, in this case, this will be a mu and not h mu nu, but it's the same thing. And in principle, there are corrections, right? So h to the n. So that's the theory that we're dealing with. <coughs> But since this is a theory of a spin to field in flat space, and in the usual way we can define a T minu, that we can either define it this way actually, you know, what's on the other side of the equation. Um, because if you remember, when we wrote this equation, if you take D mu here, this is zero, and therefore the D mu on the other side is zero. So that other side will be your T minu. Or you can define the T minu in the usual not a uh, current way. Um, did I write it? So if you have a conserved charge as a T minu in linearized gravity, and this is your Lagrangian, then you can take the derivative of your Lagrangian with respect to your field. And then there's the issue of whether this is symmetric. But then you have this Belafonte tensor, so what? No, so to make it symmetric in general. Um, so either way, you're going to get that, uh, the, this pseudo tensor, this lambda pseudo tensor, or Belafonte tensor, or whatever it's called when you symmetrize it, which for us, we only care in the TT gauge. So this guy will be uh, 1 over 32 pi G Newton, D alpha H minu, D beta H minu. H 
would they spin you up? Yeah. Sorry? In the left, this, this. Here there is nothing. Um, this is minus the Minkowski metric times uh, H mu. The index is strong. L, sorry. It's mu nu. Good, good. Uh, wait, so then this one is not right. This alpha, wait, I have the, the in this run, this would be beta. And this is alpha beta. This is alpha beta, yes. Now I'm doubting whether I it correctly. It's the usual team you know in, in field theory is that if you have a if you have a um, that's the, the translation symmetry, right? And you do the conserved current, right? Um, in terms of partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to derivatives of the field. Right? And uh, go back and check. Maybe I copied it wrong. This is correct, though. Um, are we only going to care about um, uh, the, in the TT gauge? So it's going to be just the uh, spatial components. So now there is, there is uh, um, the conservation law. We can define the energy, so the T0, 0 component with the D0, T0, 0, so it could be the time dependent, the time variation of the energy on some volume for the gravitational wave. And that that will be, oh, did I erase it? This will be like the surface integral on some surface. So we're going to have some volume and then some flux on some surface. And the integral of T0, 0 will be our energy, and it's going to change with time. And on the other side, we're going to get this 0, right? On the other side, we get an integral of the divergence, but when we go to the surface, that's the usual thing they've done a million times. And then you get the E dot. So integral over the surface. And it's the T0 i and times the and I, and there's some N I. Okay, now you have to be careful with the signs because um, then there is a minus, but then there is the up and down, and I have the opposite uh, metric. I'm not going to care about the sign because at the end I do. I just know that the energy is going to be lost. Okay, but go back and do this carefully. I always get lost with the signs. Um, I know the answer is correct, obviously, and, 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 and what's going to happen is many signs. So there is a sign that you go to the other side. Then there is a sign because we're using the plus, minus, minus, minus metric, and then up and down is not the same. Okay? And there's another sign which is important here. It's like, who is this, who is this guy? So this guy, if you go here, it has the temporal component, which is good, but then there's the radial. It's a spatial derivative in the direction of n, so it's a radial derivative. Okay? But we just found that it's a function of t minus r. So derivatives with respect to r and derivatives with respect to t are the same, up to the sign, but then we have the derivative up versus the derivative down, and that fixes the sign, so you go up uh, uh, plus. So then the E dot, it's equal. So what I'm saying is that the derivative R of the HIJ in the TT gauge, 
derivative t. This is a derivative up, and I'm going down. Because it's a function of t minus r. So then instead of having rt, I get tt, which is what I want. So then this guy becomes d0, and I'm going now to the tt gauge. So I'm going to go dE by dt. And then it's a surface integral. So I'm going to have some solid angle and some r square. In the case like r, right? And 1 over 32 pi. And change it. So it's essentially the time derivative of this guy is square. So now you see where this extra derivative came from in the quadrupole formula. So this pseudo tensor that is conserved, that comes from the fact that we linearized gravity, there's a conserved quantity that we can associate with the uh, energy of the wave, the same way that we do this pointing vector for electromagnetism. And then there is some energy, some flux of uh, T0, zero, zero, so of T0i, sorry. So there is some change of energy in this volume. There is some flux of gravitational waves. And this is essentially the square of, uh, of the time derivative of the, of the metric. It's not different than what you do in, uh, in electromagnetism with the E cross B. And you do exactly the same tricks, by the way. So this is not different than electromagnetism. So we're almost there, because we know who this H is. And now we have to take one more derivative. The R squares will cancel. The projection is a projection, so the square is the same thing. So the E dot. It's going to end up um, G Newton. There's the 32. Um, there's the 32 pi. And there's a 2 over there. There's a G Newton, but there's another G Newton, so you get square. So we're 16 pi, if I'm correct. And there's I, J, K, L. And there's are three derivatives of this guy. that sometimes are denoted uh, this way. Uh, and this is like d e d t d omega. And now you have to do the um, um, no, actually it's a 4 is an 8, right? It's twice the same guy. It's 2 and 2. So this H is 2 and 2. 4 is 8. See, I was, I was playing Einstein. Uh, so now we just have to do the angular integral. And the only thing that depends on n is this guy. And all we need now are all those integrals that you've seen before. And i and j, it's like a third, delta j, I believe. And the other one that you need over 4 pi, the other, the other one that you need is this one. And I and J and K and L. Remember who this guy was. This was the P, I, K, P, J, L minus the trace. And each one of these is delta minus N, N. And therefore, you get a bunch of n's up to four or two, or two and traces and so on. So you use all these combinations. This is um, one over 15, actually, with all the symmetrized deltas, products of deltas. So delta, delta, right? And all possible symmetrizations. 
You do that, and then you find out that the integral of this object um, it gives you a 2 pi over 15 and a bunch of deltas. The only one that we care is the one that doesn't hit traces because the traces are zero. Remember, it's trace free just by construction. And the par um, gives you an extra factor of 12 and contracts the indices, delta i, k, delta j, l. It's symmetric. So actually, there's different combinations. But at the end of the day, this is what survives. And then from here, then we get e dot equal g newton over phi q i j three derivatives uh, trace free square, and this is our famous quadruple form. that I only get to derive this way when I lecture on, on gravitational waves. Because we will see that this follows almost straightforward um, from completing essentially an amplitude and square it very, very quickly. Okay? And we don't have to do all this. But it's nice to see how it works, because this is how uh, 19th century physics worked. Right? This, is this is upgraded electro electromagnetism. Right? Plus some subtleties trying to understand where the heck is the energy. Okay? Because it's a theory of space and time, and you have this gauge invariance. And unlike electromagnetism, where okay, it's not quantum and classical electromagnetism, we don't measure A. A doesn't play any role. There are no phases. H does play a role. Right? It's space and time. Length. So what the heck is going on? That's the only subtlety that confuses a lot of people. But otherwise, the same computational mathematical. You can just ignore, first, ignore the thinking and just do the math. Once the math gives you the answer, then do the thinking. Right? Make sure you don't screw up the math. Um, OK? So let's stop here for a few minutes. Um, how much? So I, I can go, if we stop, I can go another half an hour, maybe? Ha, yes? Is that correct? So that my idea would be now, with everything that we know, to just get, look at the data and get all the information about uh, the gravitational wave. Okay? And hopefully, once we do that with the generalized theory, next uh, we go into the factor theory and, and redo all this and include the nonlinearities with this uh, other way of doing it. Okay? So let's break for a few minutes and then uh, come back. Okay? All right. So these are the two main equations for linearized gravity done in the uh, more standard way. And the main object is the quadruple um, whose uh, time variation gives us uh, the metric, which we observe here with the LIGO detector through these two polarizations. And the energy that has been carried by the wave, if we look at the, at the, at the region of where the matter is, that's, so it's one, it's what has been lost by the system. Right? So there is positive energy going away, which means it's been removed from the matter. OK, so now let's do some basic uh, numerology, if you want, or Fermi. We will. We will carry the numbers, but you will see that much of the understanding comes just from the scaling, right? How the quadruple scales with length. We have many derivatives. And then there will be numbers, like 1 over 5. Actually, the, the ones that was, yeah, it's going to appear is this 32 over 5 when we compute the power for the case of the binary. So this is generic, right? So now we're going to do the case. A very simplified case of uh, two particles of mass m1 and m2 that are separated by a distance r. Now, actually, there is a, 
a T menu here is localized, if you want. So when we compute this, there will be a delta function on the wall line. And therefore, it will be just the sum of mx1 m plus mx2. x1 is 1, mx2 is 2, right? The same way that you would do a dipole. So this is an integral over the volume, but if the particles are, if we treat them as pole-like, and we'll see how we do that consistently, then the same way that you compute the center of mass, the sum of mi xi, now you compute the quadruple, the sum of mi xi xj, OK? So that will be this integral, because the t will be the sum of the uh, x2 of t and the x1 of t. So the qij is the sum mi x1. Uh, uh, OK, let's, let's call it i. i1, 2. Ah, no, a. xi, xj. And then you have to take away the trace. So minus, um, it's a, a, So now let's just look at a very simple case of those two particles orbiting each other. We can go to the center of mass, so there is this reduced mass that will appear in the calculation. This will be an exercise that you can do um, and, uh, in your spare time. Uh, so uh, it's 1 over mu, 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 that appears in the, in the equation. So m1 and 2 over m is mu, then this is mu. So the mu times m will be m1, m2. So sometimes you will see uh, that instead of m1, m2, we write mu m, right? But this is, uh, so the dynamics is like if you have a single particle in the center of mass, but with mass mu, as you know. Uh, OK, let me do it this way here. This guy, without taking the trace, when you localize it on the wall lines, the t mu nu will have a delta of x minus whatever the particle is, right? And a mass. So the t mu nu, uh, a, sorry, the t mu nu will be the sum of this. Uh, uh, the T0, 0, sorry. Because if you remember in relativity, then it will be a V mu, V nu, and V0, zero, V0 zero will be 1. Right? We're going to do uh, the linear order. So another important, thank you for your question. Now, there's something important here. This is the leading order in the multiple expansion. But I haven't, told, I haven't yet, uh, uh, I haven't said anything about who this T mu is. And now we start saying, OK, the T mu is two particles going around each other in a circular orbit. Now, what is the T mu of a particle? You might remember, if, and we will do this uh, uh, later, that if you have a particle, you have a, an associated T mu, right? Which, if you treat as a point particle, it will be some localized source. And then the T mu will be proportional, not the T0, zero, zero. The T mu, there is nothing else but the velocity. So it goes like V mu, V nu, right? Like derivatives with respect to the proper time. We'll see that explicitly when we construct the effective action. But if you do V0, V0, of course, that's not 1 necessarily, right? So what is the V0? It will be dx0 d tau. And dt d tau is a gamma that has an expansion in velocity. So now comes the interesting question is that each one of these guys will have an expansion in velo velocity themselves. And also, when we include the corrections from the binding energy, there will be also corrections from GM over R that will also go like V squared. When the moment will be sourced by the binding, because the T0 will also include the binding energy. 
So now, on top of having a multiple expansion, which is expansion in V, because it's k dot x goes like V, which is much less than 1, there is also a post-Newtonian expansion of the sources, because they are not moving very fast, so the proper time and the time are uh, very close to each other, and also in the nonlinearities of GR, which are also power counters powers of P. So you see there's uh, many, many scales involved. Now, for this problem in particular, this is going to be 1, because we're going to do leading post-Newtonian, and the V0, 0 is 1, so the T0, 0, which is just the mass the density, this is its rho, it's just the sum of the localized source, which is delta. Right? Does that make sense? Now, when you put it here, the delta just picks the particle. So then you have a sum in A of MA, uh, X, uh, A, I, X, A, J. And then you have to take the tracer. Okay? This is an exercise. I want you to do this as an exercise because it's an interesting exercise. Actually, this could be the exam exercise. Um, so I'll do sufficiently, but uh, not everything. Um, and as you know, because you can go to the center of mass, there's the mu that appears, which is the reduced mass, with m is the total m. So it's m1 and 2 over m1 plus m2. And then you can show um, that this qij this qij trace free there's nothing else it can depend on. There's some uh, um, length scales. The scale is the separation. The, the mass is the, is the uh, reduced mass because it's the natural uh, mass in the problem when you go to the central mass frame. And there's a tensor here. And that tensor has components. So there's an xx component. Uh, this is going to be in the xy plane. So there's no c component of this, but when we take the trace, there is a delta CC, right? Which give it a Z component because we're taking out the trace. So this is a third from the traces, right? Cosine of 2 omega T, and omega is the orbital frequency. And I'm calling it omega to distinguish that this is the orbital frequency to distinguish this from the uh, gravitational wave frequency because of this factor of 2, OK? Then yy is the same. But as you remember, it goes in the other way. And then there's a cc component. This is just uh, minus 2. Three. And then there is, this is the diagonal, and then there is the off-diagonal piece, x, y, which is sine to omega t. So now we just have to take derivatives to compute this, or for example, to compute uh, the power. Uh, how much do I want to do? Um, so the power actually, if we compute it per uh, solid angle. So this is the theta equals zero plane. Sorry, theta equals pi over two plane. So this is the this is the theta equals zero direction. So 
So we computed the total integrated power, but we can look at the, at the power per solid angle just by uh, undoing some of the steps that we did. And this will go like this, just on, on, uh, on uh, um, dimensional analysis, just has three derivatives. So there's omega at the time scale. So there's omega cubed, but it's squared, so omega to the sixth. There's two quadruples, so it's r to the four, and there's two mu. So the only thing you need to work out is the number, and I hope uh, I did it correctly. It goes like this. And the mass is moving here. X, Y. So I'm just trying to illustrate something which is uh, um, in terms of the observations. So most of the power goes here when this maximizes this guy. So we get to see these guys like this. From, because most of the power will come, or we'll get the most power when we are um, perpendicular, right? So this, what, this, what I'm saying this is because it's hard to see, for example, oscillations of this plane, which, for example, have to do with something that I haven't talked about, is that what happens if these particles have some spin? So they, they, this motion doesn't occur in a plane anymore, and this plane starts moving. But we have an observational bias that most of the power comes like when they're like this, and therefore it's really hard to see this effect. But what we care here is just uh, the scaling, right? It's like um, just some dimensional analysis, if you want. Uh, we can also compute the two polarizations, which you can do also as an exercise. Uh, and H cross. And this is 2g over r, it's mu r square, omega square, it's cosine square, 2 lambda t. That's q sorry, cos square gamma t, this is uh, 1 plus cos square, sorry, of theta. And this guy is the same and sine of 2 omega t times cos theta. So you actually see that the, the wave that comes uh, this way and it's, um, it has both polarizations because it's cos, right? <coughs> but actually, if you look at the, at the combination, you get that this goes like e to the, or the real part. It's because you have the sine and the cosine. What I'm trying to tell you is that it will be circularly polarized. Which is the one that we get the most, and we will see it the most in the detector. Okay. If we compute the total power and we do the integral of this angular dependence, um, which is just one step before we did this, okay? It's not no mystery, right? Then from here, when we do the integral, we get the E dot, and that's where this celebrated 35 with 5 comes on, and then the same. Mu square R4 omega to the 6. So very simple. It's like the same as trying to do some dipole radiation. Now it's a little bit more complicated. There's a quadrupole, there's a trace part, there's a power. And notice that the power goes with a high power of, uh, of the frequencies to the sixth power. So it takes a lot of derivatives. So we can also estimate how much power is uh, radiated in the, in the process. And we can compare, for example, with the uh, uh, non-process. So how can we calculate, for example, from here, 
what we observe, we don't observe this. We see the amplitude, but, but what we observe, observe the most of the amplitude is the change of the frequency with time. Okay? This, this uh, frequency here at a given time, right, is oscillating. But as the, wave, uh, as the system loses uh, energy in one orbit, we have, if you want, this is on average on one orbit, so the frequency did not change much. But we can go from circular orbit to circular orbit. As long as this parameter small, we can treat each step as one circular orbit, next circular orbit, right? Because it's not changing much. So the R dot is also not changing much. And therefore, we can compute the change in the frequency in time, which will be related to the change in the phase and the deferometer, which is what we observe. So how does the frequency change with time is the you know, observable that we will see through this interference. interference. So the question is, what is this parameter? Because if we can solve for this, then we can solve for the frequency of the gravitational waves, which as we see here, the frequency is twice, and then, and then you have to divide by 2 pi. So it's omega over pi in hertz. So if we know a leading order, right, from the quadruple, Higher multiples will have different coefficients here, but the leading order will be these two. There are also high, different polarizations that will contribute, not just the L equal two mode, there will be higher modes, okay? But the leading mode is, is this one, and so the frequency is twice the orbital frequency. So if we know how this changes with time, we know how the gravitational wave changes with time. And the integral of this is the phase between some initial time in which it enters until it exits or merges. So if we can track the phase of the wave, that's our observable. And this, for some reason you can uh, trade the time by the frequency because at a given time also the, the orbit has some a given frequency. So for, and then you basically uh, trade this integral in time in, in, a, in a band of frequency initial to frequency final, even though you're integrating the frequency of the wave. So it's a little... Uh, so you're, you, you can always go to Fourier space, right, of a function which is the frequency, but it's in Fourier space. And then you bound that into the frequencies of the band when it enters, and for example, when it merges, okay? And this is in frequency, let's call it different if you want. Because this is in frequency space of the gravitational wave frequency, okay? That then you can try in frequency, and that's how you get this, this factor that I told you. I don't have time to go through this, unfortunately. Um, let's call it differently. Um, that gives you this that looks like, like you see, it goes like this. Because you're not tracking in time, you're tracking in frequency, okay? Don't worry about that. Yeah. It's just that when you see the pictures that LIGO give you with the band and the, they all seem to go like this and that you should be bothered why is it going down, okay? Anyway, if it doesn't bother you, don't worry. So we're gonna compute the phase of the wave, we're gonna compute this, we're gonna know the orbital uh, frequency, so we want to know this parameter, which will allow us also to do this adiabatic approximation in which we can treat the system as if it's in a circular orbit all the time. Circular orbit, circular orbit, circular orbit. Now, this will not be the case in, when, as we approach the merger. This parameter is only small when we're in this spiral regime, but there are many, many, many cycles in that regime, so we're good. We can do a lot. We can extract a lot of information from the data, assuming that that is, that is true. So how do we get this? Well, we, not like this but at least to lead in order this is correct. Um, what is the energy of the system? 
Well, where is the energy being extracted from? Well, from the binding energy of the system. So there are masses, but the masses, let's assume, don't change with time. So M1 and M2 are constant. So where else is the energy stored in the binding? So it's one half mb squared plus minus gm over r, mm, right? But as you know, the v squared and the gm over r are comparable through the Birer theorem. So this is minus a half gm1, m2, but it's like the same as mu over r. Okay? And then we know how the energy has been extracted into the gravitational waves, which has been lost here. It's negative because it's a bound state, right? In fact, you can compute the total. One way in which we can estimate the total radiated energy in a process is that you imagine those guys are very, very far, and at some point they get very, very close. So there's all this energy, this negative binding energy. So where did the energy go? Well, it went into gravitational waves. And then you can estimate how close you get if you assume that those guys get very, very, very close, for example, the Schwarzschild radius. You can estimate just by putting those numbers here of the Schwarzschild radius how much energy was emitted in gravitational waves, assuming that they're far apart. So they're basically unbounded at zero velocity. And just going in, you know, doesn't matter how much it long it takes. It takes billions of years. We only see the very, very last, maybe a minute, of the coalescence, right? So can you imagine that? This, the things were formed like millions of years ago. They go around, they don't even have black holes yet. There are stars, the stars explode. You have all these very complicated formation mechanisms. Then they orbit for millions of years. They get very, very, very close, and we get to see the very last blip. And then we're trying to learn about and reconstruct all that story, right? And see new physics. Uh, isn't that cool, huh? Um, OK, so now we're here. We put the dots, and we can uh, uh, estimate how R changes with time. And we can also use uh, Kepler's law. to then relate the equation of R to an equation in omega. Because if you put dot here, you compute R dot, because it's here. So you, uh, you know how R changes, and then you uh, solve for omega. And if I didn't do this, I did this quickly. So you can check this, please. That is correct. This is like this. times r omega. And I wrote it this way because this is the tangential velocity, omega r, right? This is the radial velocity. And the relationship, this is done by the adiabatic parameter, which is much, much less than one, so in a period, the radius does not change much, OK? And then from here, you get the equation for omega. Which uh, the 32 becomes 96. There is this funny parameter, nu, which is just an extra m downstairs, which is called the symmetric mass ratio. Which has to be because the answer cannot depend on the exchange of M1 and M2. And there is GM M total mass omega to the phi third. Now, if you go back to Kepler's law, you realize that the velocity, the tangential velocity, square goes like gm omega to the two-third. Sometimes this parameter in the post-Newtonian literature is called x. So this goes 
like v to the phi. OK, and v, or x, is much, much less than 1. Now you put the c's back. Let's just not put them. It's much, much less than 1. Then this parameter is small. OK? And therefore, the radial change is tiny compared to the period. And this can be used also to compute the change in the frequency of the wave. The difference will be this factor of pi. And then you also see what, something happening. What, did I, what, what happened is uh, um, there's a funny combination of the masses here. Right? It's symmetric. It's all good. But there's this nu, and there's the total mass. I split it this way so I can get the power counting right? in terms of a dimensionless number and a velocity. But the mass parameter that is entering here is this nu to the 3 fifth times the mass. It so happened, and I cannot do this uh, properly. I, uh, it looks like mu. Let's call it mc. Okay. Sometimes you see it as a curly m, but it's very, it's very hard to distinguish from this mu, I mean, in the board at least. It's the, what is called the shear mass. Which is nu to the, sorry, to the 3 half times m. Sometimes, I mean, you can see it also as new cube m squared equal m to the fifth. Uh, M5, sorry. But this is the most, um, uh, the most inspiring way to write it because we know that the shear mass is like the total mass weighted by how asymmetric the system is. Okay? So writing, writing explicitly what uh, um, the shear mass is is not very illuminated. Why I wrote square here is because I should have put mu. So remember, this is actually mu over m to the 3 fifth. So there is an m cube, mu cube, when you put it to the fifth power, m squared. So actually, what I should have written, and that was wrong, is mu cube m squared to the fifth. And this is often how you see it, not this way. But the nice thing about writing this way is what I just said. It's an idea of how much mass there is in the system, and it's weighted by how asymmetric it is. For comparable masses, this parameter nu, actually, this parameter nu, um, it varies between uh, zero and a quarter. So what happens is it peaks when the masses are the same. If you write this way, if you write m1 as a parameter times the total m and m2, then this y, this function is uh, 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 the sum of the two is m, right? This function has to do with m1, m2, so it's a product. So it's y, which picks as a half and it gives you a quarter. Right, because it's m1, m2 divided by m squared, so this drops out, it's just this function, trivia, equals a quarter. When they're the same, when this is a half of the total mass, right? So good, so if it's bounded by a quarter, then we know that the, the total mass has to be bigger, right? Because it's always smaller than the shear mass. So if you have an idea of the shear mass and how asymmetric the system is, then you know the total mass. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know. We are missing one parameter here, 
which is what is Q, like the mass ratio. But we need another, more information to extract from the data, um, from the theory related to the data, trying to fit the data with the theory, the mass ratio. We will get the chain mass. We can have an idea of, um, um, of the total mass by measuring the chain mass because of this bound that I just told you. Um, but that's as far as we can go. Did I worry? I will use it in a second to get the, the information for the, um, for the first detection. But we get, the, we get this, uh, this funny combination here. So what is the equation for, for the frequency? It's the same up to a factor of pi. So we know how the frequency changes with time. And it's just this pi. And it's the g now to the chirp, to the phi third. I just put the square up, right? So it's a 6 plus 5, 11. No mystery. But now we have an equation. And if you look at the data, if, in fact, if, um, if you were Fermi, and so we are here, we have to say this, right? Um, what would you have done? You would have said, OK. You, you would have looked at the picture of the explosion, right, of the atomic bomb, and uh, tried to measure how much energy was released, right? So you would look at the picture of LIGO data. What is the LIGO data? The LIGO, I'm too close to this. The LIGO data tells how the frequency, ah, the frequency. Um, <laughs> that is a gravitational wave, by the way. You can hear them. Um, around 100 hertz, right? It's audible. Um, so you see them starting at around, um, I think, 40 hertz and up to, what, 300 hertz? And it takes something like, uh, I think it's uh, 35 to 42. So I think it's, this takes something like 0 0.08 seconds. And you go from 40 to about 300 hertz. And then you hear something like that. Does it work? No. Um, so, and we have an equation that tells us how the frequency changes with time that we can integrate right, very easily. And then we can solve it and try to match this data. This data tells you how the frequency changes with time. And if I match the data, I can extract the shear mass. And if I know the shear mass from here, I know that the total mass is bigger or equal to the shear mass times 2 to the 5, 6. So it's essentially just twice, if you want, as big, or barely bigger than two. So now the question is, how do we get the shear mass from here? And um, what I was saying about Fermi was the following. If you were Fermi and you were thinking, OK, you look at this picture. Somebody handed you this picture. And then you, you figure out that this takes 0 0.08 seconds. And you see how much the frequency change. And then you think, well, gravity is special. The mass is conserved. The center of mass doesn't move. So it comes from some quadruple, right? Uh, just on dimensional analysis, you can get how the formula is going to look like. Even if you don't know this, it's just the power. If you know it goes like r squared, you're going to fit it to be that over there. Just put coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, whatever, and just make an energy, OK? You will not get the 32 over 5, 
Most of the units will come because you will realize a linear order is a G Newton on there, and there is a quadruple, there is an R to the 4, and it has to have an M R, M R square square. So it will be an M square R to the 4 and G Newton, then the omega to the 6 is just going to come from the units. And then you figure out there has to be three derivatives. Okay? So you will find out that formula, you will not get the 32 over 5. It's fine. There is, um, there is a nice 6 over 5 here, but if you, and the, the pi you will get just from what we just said, maybe you don't get that it's a factor of 2, although you kind of realize uh, that there's two x's if it's a quadruple and then has it's the 2 up here. Um, you might not know exactly the details of the phi's and so on, but you will get something like this. And then you, you will be able to tell me that there is a change in frequency which is associated with a change in time. You put, uh, do this as an exercise. Put this here, then you do the integral, then you get an f to the a third. And then there is a dt that is multiplied by this mass scale. So dt is 0 0.008. The variation of the frequency is this, but there's an f to the eighth, so it's a very high power. So one over that will kill the endpoint, which is essentially infinity, and it will be just the initial frequency that matters. When do you start seeing the, the, the wave? And how long it takes to merge? And then you put that information, and then you can extract this value. You can even fit, you can try to fit a, a, a straight line as well, right? If you just plot the log with the log of the frequency and the dt, and then you get the coefficient is this. OK? Just by looking at the data. And then you get a shear mass that comes out of this. If you put the 19 over phi and the pi's and so on, if you don't, you get it off by a little bit, but not by much, of around 35 solar masses, if I'm correct. We tells you how the total mass for if they were comparable, it's around 70, which is, by the way, I think it was 65, the total, what we observed. Okay? Of course, this doesn't work all the way towards the merger. This is just a linear approximation. Okay? But you look at the data, and you get a very good idea of what you're looking at. So what else can we learn from the observation? Um, Okay, I don't know if I'm going too much uh, over time. I have just maybe five minutes, five, ten minutes, is that okay? Okay. Let me tell you what else we can, we can learn. Um, so we can go back to all these formulas that we wrote about how big the amplitude is, right? How the frequency that we observe, right, is related also through the Kepler formula to some distance, how close they can get, because now we have an idea of how much mass we have, okay? And then we can start to see how close the sky is got, what is the amplitude, how far they are, just from looking at, even it's just the almost dimensional analysis. So I'm just going to write the answer, and you can try to reproduce it. Just by using Newtonian physics for the energy, Newtonian binding energy, and quadruple formula for the radiation. Um, So what do we learn? We learn about the amplitude, which is of the order which we just did. It's the quadruple and two derivatives, and there is some distance. We can rewrite this And remember, because of the omega square, okay? And remember that this is m1 and 2. So don't get confused by the extra g. It's just the Kepler law, okay? But why did I do that? It's because notice that now we got g m1, g m2. And here we got 1 over r. And then here we get like the Schwarzschild radius of the 1 the Schwarzschild radius of the two. And this is a very cool way to write it. Because it tells you that the amplitude is proportional to the Schwarzschild radius divided by the distance and the separation. 
And that's not so crazy because um, these are the only scales around. Right? You just have to figure out what the uh, distance is. So now if you write this in units, meaning I just put solar masses and put the, whatever the mass of the sun is and so on, um, we get something like this. So we're going to use four kilometers, which is more or less what a neutron star. Uh, so the Schwarzschild radius of the sun um, is about three kilometers. So one and two. And then we're going to compare it with something like a 40 megaparsec and 100 kilometers apart. And then we get an amplitude which, if no mistake, is around 10 to the minus 22, which is very small. But of course, it's a little bit enhanced because we just determined that the uh, the mass of this guy was big, and actually they were around 30 each, right? So there's a bit of, a bit of an enhancement here, right? It was a little farther apart. It was like 400 megaparsec, I think. Uh, that we can get by estimating what this distance is by getting the, 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 um, the highest amplitude will be when these guys are as close. And we can estimate that just by saying, well, how close can they get? And if you take the Schwarzschild radius, which will be around uh, 30, maybe, solar masses and so on, then you can say, well, how close they can get? Well, they're very close to be um, uh, near each other, near the, the Schwarzschild radius. And you get that by computing, for example, the cutoff frequency, which was 300 hertz. And you can say at 300 hertz in the Kepler law, with a total mass, which is about 70 solar masses, how close can I get? OK? And then you get about like 300 kilometers. So when you put all that in there, you get an amplitude which is 10 to the minus 20, uh, um, 20, 20, 21. And in fact, by observing that amplitude, then you get the distance or what is called the luminosity distance. If we use this as an observable, we measure this. Then we get the distance, and that distance turned out to be, I think, 400 megaparsecs. Or R, right? Which you get also from this, you get from Kepler, and the cutoff frequency of 300 hertz, with a total mass of about 70 solar masses. So we almost know everything. We know how far it was. We know how close it got. And, and we also know that these are very compact objects because 300 hertz is really high. The stars will be ripped apart way before they can get to that distance. So these are objects that go hundreds of kilometers apart with all this mass. So the density is huge. OK? So these are very compact objects. We don't know yet they are black holes. But we know they're extremely compact objects. And they have to be, and they have to move very fast to produce something which is tiny, 10 to the minus 20, that we see through small variations in the length of the arms of the, of the detectors. Um, OK, I have a few more things, but I have to stop. So what I'm going to do now, um, just to finish, is say, very good. How, how can we tell um, these guys were really black holes? Oh, by the way, let me just say one more thing. The total power radiated that we can uh, compute from there, um, do this as an exercise. You can show the same way that it was the, the omega dot over omega square. Did I erase it? It was this v to the 5 that we computed. The e dot will go like v to the 10. And the units are this uh, famous, if you want, Planck luminosity, which there is no h bar if you use Planck units. You can get a, 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 um, a units of luminosity, right, of energy per unit of time, this Planck luminosity. And the, one, the, the uh, total radiated energy goes like v to the 10. It's just the same we did before with the omega dot over omega square, but now for the e. And this number, you can put some units, is 10 to the 52 watts. 
And I think the sun is emitting 10 to the 26 in electromagnetic radiation. And we have of the order of 10 to the 20 stars, or 22. So it kind of looks like, if you look at all the visible stars emitting in light, right? When you see in the period where you're very close to coalescence where the velocities are large, you don't quite get 52, you get maybe 48, 49. It's very close to just power releasing all the stars that we can see. So this is an amazing amount of power, right? Now you can ask if that happens, I mean, if, if a supernova explodes in the galaxy, what happens to us? Now what happens if we see black hole collisions in the galaxy with lots of energy coming to us? Well, gravity is very weak, Thank, thankfully, well, I don't know, maybe. But it's amazing how big these numbers are. Right? Okay, I'm finishing. The only thing I want to say is that if you calculate also now um, the number of cycles that we see in van, like between 10 hertz and a kilohertz, which is what we determined earlier, was the, the LIGO van, then you can estimate also how that changes with mass just by looking at the integral of the frequency. That's the phase. So how much the phase moves in radians over 2 pi, right? And this is very easy. You do the same, the same type of manipulations, use the same, the same rules, and then we get that the number of cycles goes like 10 to the 4. Even though the delta t could be 5 minutes, and it goes with the mass, it scales with the total mass to the uh, 1 over 8 thirds, so you see that it's reduced significantly if the mass is large. But for masses of the, like neutron stars, you can get maybe a minute in band between 10 hertz and a kilohertz. In that period of time, you can get up to 10 to the 4 um, cycles. So we got the same scaling with the mass, which is minus 5. Then. So what this is telling us is that even though um, these things go very fast, they produce all these physics that we just saw, they go around many, 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 many times, and they, we might get long signals. So even though we just extract the chip mass, maybe if we track the phase very, very well, not just through leading order here, but also including all the corrections to the binding energies, all the corrections to the flux, we start seeing corrections to this evolution equation, not so much in the amplitude, but in the phase. So this guy that it has the 96 over phi uh, nu and then v to the phi, then here is leading order plus corrections. And all those corrections, because we have so much signal, we might have a long template that we can do that analysis with, will tell us, because the first correction we know about m2 over m1. Then we get the mass ratio. Chirp mass, mass ratio. Then we get spin. We get a chirp spin. We get a combination of S1 and S2. We get also combinations multiplied by the angular momentum. So we got to go to higher orders to disentangle those. And then we get mass and spin. Now the question is, is there something new here? So that's what we're going to study next. Uh, how do we parameterize that newness? OK? All right, I should stop here. Thank you.